Isekai is a genre that's taken over the anime world. I feel that the momentum of the series reached its peak a couple of years ago. Those starting out watching seasonals these years don't know how much of a meme Isekai was back in the mid to late 2010s. Plus, I've taken it upon myself to give you a trip back in time, to a time when the Isekai craze was at its zenith, which is to say, not too far ago. But for the sake of sticking to the theme, I'll be listing what I feel are the top 20 action Isekai from the past two decades or so. Action Isekai means those with a focus on action, so so as much as I want to include some of my favourite shows like Ascendance of a Bookworm or your boy Kong Ming, I'll have to sit this one out. Starting out the list, we have a newcomer, reincarnated as a sword. Reincarnated as a sword's not exactly a show that set the world on fire, you know? And that's not unexpected, given that it's a show that shared a season with Chainsaw Man, Blue Lock, Eminence in Shadow, and a lot of sequels. Oh, and Bocce Fever also took over big time. But if we take away all of those big hits, Reincarnated as a Sword stands out as one of the better titles in the crowd of mid-tier shows. At first glance, the story seems simple, besides the unique premise of the protagonist becoming a sword. And for the most part, the story stays in form. It won't blow your mind or anything like that, admittedly. Then why is it on this list, you're probably thinking? Well, it's simply entertaining to watch the protagonist and Fran grow together. Their chemistry and how they play off each other is quite impeccable and it makes it one of the isekais that entertain me quite a bit. Characters can help carry a show as the case of something like Licorice Recoil and for me the same thing, albeit with lesser effect you know, can be said of reincarnated as a sword. Donna. <laughs> Cautious hero however turns up the comedic aspect of things. <laughs> You can never be too careful as they say, so the most effective way of fulfilling your goal in a dangerous fantasy world is to min-max your stats and take all possible precautions. But what if you take that premise and turn it up to 11? We've got this entertaining isekai that gave me a good mix of both action and comedy. Like reincarnated as a sword however, cautious hero lives and dies by how well you find the chemistry between the main leads. And to me, I found myself in stitches watching the two in this show that technically feels like a sitcom. Seiya and Ristarte's bickering and interactions remind me of Gonos specifically Aqua. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but the comedic undertones of this show extend to even the villains, because in a world where the hero is overly cautious, you also have villains who plan ahead in hilariously over-the-top ways too. Moving past the wackiness of this show, however, you can see a title that soon stands on its own as a captivating adventure with stakes. Of course, these do pale in comparison to the darker or more serious ones out there, but Cautious Hero does put in some effort to it, and I think it works out pretty fine. <laughs> That got you energised, right? Well, it's the perfect time now to introduce today's sponsors, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. If you've been loyally tuning into my videos, then you're likely to know these guys. But for those who don't, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are two subscription-based snack boxes that aim to let people from all over the world experience the unique joys of Japan right on their doorstep. The two boxes have their fair share of differences, though. Tokyo Treat caters more to those looking for the rare, exclusive and limited edition snacks that you can get from Japan. Each Tokyo Treat box comes with up to to 20 snacks. Meanwhile, Sakurako caters more to those looking to experience the more artisan side of Japanese snack culture. Each Sakurako box comes with 20 snacks. Plus, it comes with some nifty kitchenware too. For this month, the two boxes come together to bring you the joys of Yozakura. You see, even if springtime's almost over, you can still experience the last few weeks of the season through these themed snacks, all centered around the nighttime viewing of Sakura blossoms. Tokyo Treat brings you the Sakura Starlight Starfest, featuring some flavors that you probably haven't tasted before like Sakura Matcha and Sakura Cherry Bush. On the Sakurako side of things, its moonlit Sakura theme box will bring you stuff like Sakura Ame and Sakura Sweet Potato. They all look really delicious, so the right thing to do is to check out the links in the description box and get your subscription now. Do you remember Grimgar? Well, do now. <laughs> Speaking of character-centric stories, Grimgar's a top contender for a show that takes time to get the ball rolling. It actually ended up being a detriment to the show's popularity in my opinion, but Grimgar's one of the most slow-burn isekais I've ever watched. For those who can get through the first eps that are heavily focused on characterization and build-up, however, you do get a story that's worth the wait towards the end. I mean, sure it's not as hype as you'd expect out of an isekai, especially one that's marketed as quite action-y. However, I think it does bring with it its own signature flavor in the saturated world of isekai. It also has unique presentation in terms of the visuals 
visuals and the art style, so Grimgar definitely does bring a one-of-a-kind experience to anyone looking to watch it, especially those who grew up in the more modern isekai shows. And yes, I just had to put out the Spider Isekai next because I just talked about presentation and visuals. Not that Spider truly excels in anything of that sort. If anything, it's one of the show's rather mediocre aspects actually, the visuals and the presentation. I mean, it looks clunky and all, but to me, it doesn't really detract from the good that the show has to offer. This show, in spite of its rather simple premise, does offer a world that's far beyond what I've come to expect. When I expected a pretty basic underdog story of survival and rising up against all odds, what I got was something that's admittedly convoluted for my expectations. But not that that's a bad thing, because I just love it when the scale of a show escalates to include clashing ideologies, politics and the like. Everything gets helped with a very lovable and charismatic lead, and you have here a story that's pretty fun to get through if you can stomach the CG. Speaking of CG, I give you Arifureta. If you thought Spider CGI was bad, how about Arifureta and its PlayStation 1 monsters? <laughs> I mean, all kidding aside, Arifureta is probably a name you've heard of. It's become one of the poster children for edgy revenge isekais where a betrayed hero rises up and rallies against the world, and it's easy to see why, you know. The show's unapologetically over the top and edgy. Yet, beyond all the Tunibio aspects and the stuff that 15 year olds would love, I found myself enjoying the plot a lot. That as well as seeing Hajime's relationship with his ever-growing travelling party develop as they fight against the world. Season 2 does up the ante a little bit with the plot and the hilariously bad CG does get fixed. It's totally worth a shot if these kinds of shows are your type and I unironically say that Season 2 was one of the shows I looked forward to watching the most every week back in its season. Season 2 is probably one of the best comebacks a show made and the difference in production quality is just night and day. Next in line is Skeleton Knight in Another World. Have you ever seen a show that one look and you can't help but feel that it just seems inspired by something? Then enter Skeleton Knight in Another World, starring Ark, a skeleton isekai protagonist who's, yeah, Ark, not Ainz, mind you. And this is a skeleton protag who's a lot nicer and more laid back, actually. He's someone who takes things easily, unless you're one of the vile villains abusing the elves in this world that's actually a lot more evil than you'd think at first glance. A stark contrast to how colourful and vibrant everything looks, I do think that the strongest suit of the show is that it creates an image of a world that you'll find yourself pretty comfortable in. That chill JRPG vibe that some people have always wanted, plus a corrupt world under the sunshine and rainbows. The show has its fair share of controversies, mind you. It's not opposed to showing some sensitive content and all. I think it's a pretty chill isekai if you step back and look at it with a different lens. It's nothing really groundbreaking in terms of being unique or anything like that, but it could be worth a try for isekai enthusiasts. <laughs> Gate was one of the shows I watched in my college years, and it's nice to be able to talk about it. As an adult anime fan, there are a few protagonists that can resonate as closely to me as Itami Yuji. His escapades as a member of the JSDF is something that I, for the most part, enjoyed. The show also has quite the nifty setup for an isekai. Instead of everyone being forcibly transported into the fantasy world, it's them, Itami and the rest of the army, that spend the most part willingly in that world, helping out or otherwise intervening in their politics, all while showing off the superiority of the glorious Japanese weaponry and military. Yeah, that last statement was a joke, even if I said the statement almost ironically. From the get-go, the show is so obviously a love letter to the Japanese military, with people going as far as making jokes about how this is a subtle recruitment letter done in an anime form. As such, you'll see some themes and scenes that are so heavily pro-JSDF, but that doesn't really detract from the experience in my opinion. At its very core, Gate is still a pretty badass story that features its share of hype moments and comedy brought about by the numerous fish-out-of-water scenarios our heroes and their new friends from the fantasy world find themselves in. <laughs> World's Finest Assassin is another new hotshot that showed a lot of potential.
Have you ever wondered why it's always the otakus and the everyday salarymen who get transported to another world with a mission to defeat the demon lord? Well, besides meta reasons that we savvy fans know, that does beg a question. However, that's not an issue here in this show, where a grizzled assassin in life dies and gets reincarnated into this fantasy world. Of course, if your quest is to defeat the former hero, there's no better person for the job. Lug, as our protagonist is now known, begins his new training in this new world, looking to incorporate his new and growing knowledge of magic and his cold-blooded techniques from his previous life. Life, he prepares to deal with the hero, meeting new comrades and dangerous enemies along the way. A really refreshing anime from the brain behind Redo of Healer. Yeah, this feels completely different from the previous title. The world's finest assassin truly allowed Rui Sukio to showcase his talent in weaving together an intriguing story along with compelling characters. It's one of the better adaptations out there too, so you can go into this without worry about the anime being a watered down version of the novel. How's about a blast from the past now with Recreators? Being someone who's dabbled with the creative side of things, with the one to make my manga or light novel, Recreators is a show that spoke to me. It really gives me a nice hypothetical as far as content creators are concerned. What if our fictional characters, our OCs, suddenly appear in the world? What? What the f- and start working for and against each other with their own agendas at play. Now, it looked to be a possible contender for breakout title of the year when it aired, but that ultimately didn't come to fruition. Still, the show has a lot of good to offer, and it tries to jab at many different genres in order to ultimately give us a pretty creative package done in the form of a reverse isekai. The presentation looks good, the concept of fictional worlds converging in the real one is a really nice proposition, and it's got a banger of a soundtrack too. It's a show that tries to go far with a cool premise, while it fell short of being the blockbuster of its year, I do think that Recreators does deserve recognition. Sword Art Online needs no introduction, does it? SAO discussion has been beaten to death already for the past decade, but I still do think it deserves a spot on the list for the sheer legacy it brought with it. It's no granddaddy of Isekai or anything like that, but it did break open the floodgates and help usher in the Isekai boom. And taking a look at the show in its own right, it is still pretty good. In terms of production quality, it's easily one of A1's most beloved works, with Alicization being a shining point in terms of epic fight animation and presentation. It also explores some themes that feel more and more relevant the more time progresses, with a heavy emphasis on the melding of the real and the virtual. I feel like SAO can be a fringe case because the way the other world aspect was executed differed greatly after the first arc was done. Wait a minute! Who are you? But there's no denying how influential this title is to the world of Isekai. You may have already watched it, but if you're still on the fence, then make sure you go for it. Don't forget to watch the ordinal scale movie before Alicization 2. <laughs> And we're now officially at the halfway point. But for now, hit that like button if you've been enjoying the show. It helps the channel immensely and it will help you get more videos like this on your recommendations. Next up we have Tsukimichi Moonlit Fantasy. Sometimes isekai protagonists just get the short end of the stick. You can become the strongest being in the planet, with girls swooning over you, and at times you can just be as unfortunate as Makato. Deemed hideous by the goddess, he gets thrown into nowhere, as far from the human civilization as possible. At the very least, he still has immense powers that captivate the numerous denizens of the world. It's pretty interesting to see betrayed by a deity stories like this take a light-hearted note. From the get-go, you already know that Tsukimichi is a parody. It's got the fights, it's got the tension, but it leans really heavily on the comedian territory. It's got this great balance between action and comedy regardless, and that's coming from a studio that doesn't have a lot under their resume in terms of action shows. Tsukimichi is an underrated show that you should definitely give a try. It just seems so right to put shows with similar premises right next to each other. Thus, we go for Shield Hero, a popular light novel with the whole betrayed protagonist setup. However, Shield Hero feels more similar to Ari Fureta in terms of tone and the overall edginess. For Shield Hero, my favourite part has to be the relationship between Naofumi and Raftalia. The whole revenge plot is a good impetus, but a plot like that feels incomplete without the growing bond between our hero and his travelling party. It's something that I feel sets this apart from the likes of Ari Fureta, which gave more focus on the cooler aspects of 
exploration and combat, as well as the fan service, of course. It's unfortunate that the show didn't get the sequel that it deserved. Season 2 exists, but it just feels night and day compared to the first one, possibly because the revenge plot and the most drastic character development points get resolved in the first series. Still, it is overall a fun adventure that I'd gladly recommend to anyone looking to get into Isekai. I'm looking forward to more Shield Hero. <laughs> Princess Connect Redive deserves a spot on the list. Well, the fact that Princess Connect Redive is an isekai was never mentioned in the two series, and a third season isn't anywhere in sight. So I guess it's time to drop the bomb that, yes, this is an isekai title. It looks like one already and it feels like one, minus showing the main character get transported into the fantasy world. Now, what I like about Princess Connect is how it does story escalation. It starts out as a fun, wholesome adventure in a fantasy world full of light-hearted moments, meme quality reaction faces and the like, all before shifting gears in the second season and turning into a high-tempo action series featuring a kingdom conspiracy and some of the most unexpectedly insane battle sequences from an anime like this. It helps a lot if you've played the Princess Connect mobile game, but the story and characters are good enough to carry the series even without that prior knowledge. Princess Connect for me is one of the shows that set a new standard of quality for mobile game adaptations and it's something that I wouldn't hesitate to recommend. <laughs> if you think history is cool, you're gonna love Drifters. If fate taught us anything, it's that adding historical and legendary realm characters and putting them in a free-for-all makes for some good entertainment and money. So what if we take a similar concept and turn the violence up and sprinkle everything with an outlandish sense of swagger? That's when you get Drifters. From the same genius that gave us Helsing came the High Octane action series, and you can easily see the similarities with this one. A nifty thing about Drifters is that despite the dark ambiance, the violence and all, it still tries to sell some comedic aspects. It's always there, no matter how mundane they may seem in the form of historical in-jokes or character interactions. It's more or less a bonus if you did your homework and you get the references. But of course, you're here for action, aren't you? And it's all there in its unrestrained glory. Drifters is a joy to watch if you're in for that sort of thing, and it's a crying shame that it didn't get a proper sequel. I found myself wanting more, and I'm sure that you'll do so too. Saga of Danya did make a statement when it aired. A recurring theme in Isekai is the challenge of facing a godlike being. Few are as poised to do so as well as Danya, ruthless master of war. When being X, the god in this world, didn't take a liking to a sociopathic salaryman, he makes it a point to stick it back at the god and ascend the ranks of the imperial army in the form he was stuck in, the childlike Danya. Danya does have an ace up her sleeve in her goal of conquest, and that's the retained knowledge from the previous life as a salaryman. It certainly sets up an interesting conflict, given the unsurmountable odds god throws at Danya and her sheer will to survive and overcome. The show does have a bleak atmosphere befitting of its setting and it also offers a great look, what I feel has the vibes of a case study on psychopathic characters. There's also an in-depth look at military strategy that I'm sure fans of warfare are going to end up loving, a focus that I feel was a little bit lacking in game. If you liked Saga of Danya, this next one will be right up your alley. <sighs> Just like Saga of Danyo of Evil, Overlord features a ruthless villain protagonist set to make his mark on the world, but this time it takes place in a video game and has our protagonist take on the mantle of Ainz, the most powerful skeletal lich of all time. Viewers then get to follow him in his exploits as they learn more about the world and its denizens. Overlord at its core is a character driven story, whether you look at it from the perspective of Ainz and how his current role and remaining shreds of humanity converge, or his servants, who all show undying love and loyalty to him but in different ways. <laughs> Overall, Overlord is a refreshing take on the trapped in the video game genre. It also got much of its fanfare due to the setup of having a villain protagonist and it's got a lot of things that people just love out of these kinds of shows. An overpowered protagonist who's not afraid to flex his power, characters with notable quirks and designs, and themes that run deeper than how you'd think of them at first glance. But honestly, most people are just here mainly for the cool factor. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of a dark leader of a faction filled with loyal servants, how about Eminence in Shadow? <laughs> The 
One of the newer hits, Eminence in Shadow, wasted no time capturing the hearts of anime fans. A lot of it is credited to how overboard it is, how ironic it is to the point of parody, or to the sheer meme factor it has. It's a show that's not intended to be taken so seriously, and thus goes all the way in upping the insanity. I mean, there's a guy named Perv Ashoff for Pete's sakes. If you take away the irony to the whole thing, however, there's still a lot to like about Eminence in Shadow. It's a show that's built on moments, and while some of these supposedly awesome moments end up being funny in a case of mood whiplash, they still work, well for me at least. It has a slow start you know, but once things go full throttle it's more than an ample source of 30 minutes of entertainment that I look for every week. As you can tell, Eminence in Shadow is something that only certain types of watchers can get or enjoy, but for those in that target demographic, it's one of the most fun shows you'll be getting from the past year or so. But if you just want to see a cool, overpowered protagonist do awesome stuff while ascending the power scale, minus the parody and irony, Slime's the one for you. Reincarnated as a slime plays the whole isekai thing in a way straighter manner. It's a show that has all those fantasy gimmicks and story beats you'd expect, with the added caveat of being a genuinely interesting watch with epic moments, tearjerkers, and a lot of cool powers being put on display. The story of Rimuru's rise from a lowly slime to arguably one of the more overpowered isekai protagonists out there truly is something. A reason I liked Reincarnated as a slime, in addition to the action and the great battle choreography, is the sheer variety you have as a main cast. You've got a lot of different flavors of characters to help spice up the adventure, all while enjoying what an awesome lead Rimuru is. These characters all bring with them their own degree of wit, humour and charisma. Slime is pretty simple and straightforward, but at times it may just be what you want. A carefree, simple adventure in a bright, colourful world. Nothing that will slam you back to the reality that is the world we live in. Instead, letting us enjoy an anime for what it is, a gateway to enjoy life while feeling the thrill of epic moments, heartache from tearjerker moments and the occasional introspection. <laughs> At this point in time, the whole time loop plot is common knowledge for folks who love anime. People got to experience it from Steins Gate and Madoka at the start of the 2010s, but I'd argue that the one who put it in the realm of super mainstream is none other than ReZero. Unlike the previous two mentioned time loop shows, ReZero decides to set itself in a fantasy world, a world full of marvel and danger, as our hero Subaru tries his best to survive and reach his happy ending. It's a dark mystery thriller that's got a lot of action, suspense, and most importantly, characters who people easily resonate with, to which it owes much of its popularity in my opinion. And guess what? Season 2 made things even better. We've got more character moments, more development, and finally, some major progression in Subaru and Amelia's relationship. I mean, in some ways I enjoyed season 1 a lot better because it felt more like a mystery action thriller that season, but the second season just shows how much ReZero is capable of in terms of shattering genre barriers. And finally, we close out strong with Mushoku Tensei. The best way to close this out is what people call the granddaddy of Isekai. Whether that title holds true or not isn't important. After all, no one can deny how Mushoku Tensei influenced a lot of the conventions that we see in a lot of modern Isekai. You've got the setting, the way the main character's reincarnation was set up, and a lot of other tropes we've all come to love. Sure, there are also themes and scenes that have caused the series to have the mixed reception from people, but for those who are able to look past that, the show is such a complete experience for the genre. You've got the world building, the thrill of exploration, the story of growth, some nice action and insane fight sequences and characters to get attached to. Everything's then backed up by a studio that's hell-bent on making this series the next big thing, giving the adaptation all the love and care it needed to be a great way to introduce people into the franchise. There's not a lot of shows that get this amount of dedication from the anime team, but the folks couldn't have picked a better show to join that kind of elite company. And that's it, my top 20 picks for action isekai in the modern context. If you've got some shows that you want to include or you think I may have overlooked, feel free to tell me down in the comments section below. If you want more videos like this, the channel has them in spades. Thank you for watching all the way till the end, and I hope you'll be back for more. There'll be more videos to come, so stay tuned.